Good evening. I'm Alan Price, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. On behalf of all my library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. To open, I humbly start with a land acknowledgement to recognize the indigenous tribes of the Pawtucket and Massachusetts peoples of the Wampanoag Tribal Confederation territories who both past and present and throughout many generations have stewarded the land where the Kennedy Library is today. While the land acknowledgement is not enough, it is an important way to promote indigenous visibility and it serves as a reminder that we are on stolen and settled indigenous land. I invite all of us to contemplate how to better support indigenous communities and to learn how to honor and take care of the land that each of us inhabits. I would also like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors Bank of America, the Lowell Institute and AT&T, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe and WBUR. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening. You'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or comments on our YouTube page during the program. We are so grateful to have this opportunity to explore recent demographic trends and their significance for future elections with our distinguished guests this evening. I'm now delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. I'm so pleased to extend a warm virtual welcome to the library to Kendra Davenport Cotton, Chief Operating Officer for the New Georgia Project. She has more than 20 years of experience building and cultivating relationships to advance a favorable public image and positive strategic agenda for the individuals and organizations that she serves, including most recently prior work as the campaign manager for a US Senate race, as the founding executive director of the Rep Georgia Institute and the Represent Georgia Action Network, and as the campaign manager for a successful Georgia Association of Educators statewide ballot initiative during the November 2016 election cycle. I'd like to give a warm welcome to Robert Griffin, a senior research advisor at Democracy Fund, as well as the research director and participating author for the Democracy Fund Voter Study Group. He is the co-author and lead data analyst for the States of Change Project, a collaboration between the Center for American Progress, demographer William Frey of the Brookings Institution, and the Bipartisan Policy Center. He also serves on the editorial committee of PS, Political Science and Politics, the journal of record for the American Political Science Association. His research has appeared in many national and international media outlets. I'm also delighted to extend a warm virtual welcome to Taiku Lee, who can be heard at a, uh, shortly. Um, he is, uh, I believe, joining us shortly. We may have to have him come in midstream. He's professor of political science and George Johnson Professor of Law at the University of California, Berkeley. His research focuses on racial and ethnic politics, public opinion and survey research, identity and inequality, and deliberative and participatory democracy. His current projects include a text on racial diversity and political inequality in the US, a study of public opinion, democratic responsiveness, and financial regulation in six advanced Western democracies and several papers on anti-Asian American sentiment and the political incorporation of Asian Americans. I'd also like to give a warm virtual welcome to Gabriel R. Sanchez, Professor of Political Science and the founding Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Endowed Chair in Health Policy at the University of New Mexico. He is also the director of the University of New Mexico Center for Social Policy and a founding member of the University of New Mexico Native American Budget and Policy Institute. A principal at the Latino Decisions Survey Firm, he, is, he also serves as a David M. Rubenstein Fellow in Governance Studies at the Brookings Institution. His academic research explores the relationship between racial, ethnic identity, and political engagement, Latino health politics and policy, and minority legislative behavior. I'm also pleased to extend a warm virtual welcome back to the library to Tova Wang, a senior practice fellow in American democracy at the Harvard Kennedy School's Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. 
She has 20 years of experience working on improving democracy, most recently as Director of Policy and Research at the Center for Secure and Modern Elections. Her work has focused on issues related to greater political inclusion in the United States, including major studies on increasing voter participation rates. She is the author of the critically acclaimed book, The Politics of Voter Suppression, Defending and Expanding Americans' Right to Vote. I'm also delighted to welcome back to the library virtually our moderator for this evening. Larry Tai is a New York Times bestselling author whose most recent book is Demagogue, The Life and Long Shadow of Senator Joe McCarthy. The author of seven other books, he also runs the Boston-based Health Coverage Fellowship, which trains a dozen medical journalists a year from newspapers, radio stations, and TV outlets nationwide. From 1986 to 2001, Ty was an award-winning reporter at the Boston Globe. He has been a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University and has taught journalism at BU, Northeastern, and Tufts. Please join me in welcoming our special guests. So, Alan, thank you. Um, great introductions, as always. Um, and I want to, since this is a Kennedy Library event, I want to say two quick parochial things. One is I want to extend a special welcome to Red Sox fans who are giving up the game, or at least delaying watching it. And I promise no matter what updates I get during our program, I will not have any spoilers out there for anybody who is taping the game. I also want to say that I'm sitting here in a little village on Cape Cod called Katuit. And I'm 10 miles from Hyannisport, from the famous Kennedy compound. And I'm 10 houses from the home of Joe Kennedy II. And I want to say the issues facing Cape Cod and the country, I think today, look a whole lot like those facing Jack and especially Bobby Kennedy back in the 1960s from racism to political schisms, from a Cold War to a new brand of McCarthyism. But what has changed, I think, here and everywhere is the electorate in dramatic ways that Bobby Kennedy predicted half a century ago and hoped for, and that we're here to talk about tonight. And I can't imagine a better group to talk about these issues with. And what I'd like to do in starting is pose a question for each of our four current and hopefully a fifth panelist joining us soon. And that question is as follows. Today, as every day in newspapers and on cable news, we've had pundits giving us predictions on how our electorate is transforming and how that will shape next year's midterms and beyond. The problem with those predictions, of course, is that they keep transforming and shifting. But you five are the smartest of the experts, and I'd like you each to give us what you think is the single most important near-term change you see happening in our electorate, starting with you, Kendra, um, if you would. Thank you so much. Um, for us here in Georgia, and most of my comments today, I just want to go ahead and preface, are going to be Georgia specific because that's where I work. I would say the single most important thing that's going on um, in the electorate is not necessarily what we all hear, um, as you've already noted in the news about the browning of America. Georgia is browning very quickly as well, but it is um, where that browning is occurring. And so that, and that, that is causing us um, to change how we do our work in that, um, yes, you still have your metropolitan center of Atlanta in our state and then also now in Savannah in Macon as those um, smaller regional hubs are growing as well. But it's the suburbs around Atlanta that are browning. And we are really having, you know, that's a more sophisticated electorate. Um, they are more educated um, and it is changing the way we are governing at the state level, state and local level. Um, very quickly, I'll use Gwinnett County as an example. Gwinnett County is the largest and arguably the most diverse county in the state of Georgia. And up until this um, two cycles ago, um, 2018, it did not have one county commissioner of color, um, not one school board member of color. 
And that has all changed very rapidly, um, culminating in the 2020 election, when now um, the, there was a partisan, a partisan flip completely um, of the county commission there. And I think that surprised a lot of the elder citizenry in that um, area. And so we're, we're parsing um, what we do, and, um, but we're having to do that regionally with a focus on the suburbs. Hmm. Really interesting. And we'll kind of come back a lot tonight, I think, to Georgia. Um, Robert? Uh, thanks, Larry, and thanks for having me. Um, you know, I think we'll be talking a lot tonight about demographic change. It's something that sort of I've spent the last couple of years studying myself. Um, but I'll, I'll key off of two words that you had in there, which was near term, right? So the key thing about demographic change is it's occurring. It's occurring in lots of places. Um, at this point in American history, it's almost continual, but it's actually very slow. Um, year, year over year basis, uh, these tend to be kind of gradual changes, even when you measure this distance between election cycles every four years, these are measured in like sort of single digit changes. So these are important, right? I think they're important, but they, but if we're going to focus it on that near term, the thing that I'd actually want to focus on is how the electorate is rearranging itself attitudinally, um, that there are attitudes that have come to become much more uh, prominent definers of our politics than they were in the past. And specifically over the last decade, and, and really things even increased with the 2020 election, uh, we've just seen racial attitudes, attitudes related to uh, immigration, um, and as well as just feelings about immigrants, attitudes about systemic uh, racism uh, against African Americans in particular, just become defining features of our electorate. Um, that there was a way, even 10 years ago, this was not as much of a uh, wedge issue between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party as it is today. Um, so I, I think just, again, if we were to talk about a way in which the electorate is rearranging itself, in which the coalitions are slightly shifting, it's along these uh, more, you could almost think identity-based uh, dimensions of American politics that have just become more prominent uh, over the course of the last 10 years. And more divided and more angry? Um, I, I, I think that can come with it, for sure, right? You know, I, I, there is a way in which if you transition your politics at a relative rate, from talking more or less about taxes to more or less about issues that are very near and dear to people's hearts that are core to their identity. I think there is a way in which our politics uh, can feel more visceral in that way because we are talking about things that are just closer to the heart. Hmm. Interesting. Um, Gabe. Yeah, appreciate the great question. Thanks to the Kennedy Library folks for putting this together and inviting me. Um, I think if we're talking about immediate, I say, in my view, redistricting is the most important and immediate issue, really where the demographic shifts over the last decade have the potential, at least, to directly influence political and policy outcomes for the next decade. Now, in theory, right, the changes in the electorate we're all talking about tonight uh, should lead to revised maps that take all those changes into account. However, and unfortunately, we all know that the redistricting process is often highly partisan, and whether population shifts are reflected and the newly comprised districts varies often by the partisanship of the state legislature and the governor of the states that we're talking about. I'll give you two quick examples of some pessimism I have about how the demographic shifts may not play out the way that they should. Um, one, I'm a New Mexican, always being able to talk about Texas. Any chance we get an opportunity to out here in New Mexico, we do so. Uh, <laughs> folks might have seen this. MALDEF this week filed suit already over the redistricting maps in the state of Texas. Um, largely because despite, like the national trends, Latinos comprising half of the population increase in the state of Texas uh, and getting two congressional, congressional districts out there in Texas, none of the new districts really advance uh, Latino voice or create majority Latino districts. And in fact, MALDEF is arguing, if anything, they're diluting the overall voting power of, of Latinos in the state of Texas. Nothing new in the state of Texas, but again, a great example of how great population shifts have the potential to, to uh, influence outcomes, not necessarily if politics get involved. Second example, a little bit of a flip to that. Here in New Mexico, our Southern Congressional District, CD2, um, is one of the most competitive districts in the country over the last several election cycles and is, is the one GOP strength in the state. New maps created by our independent redistricting commissions just came out and they advanced comprising a majority Latino district down south, which would be the first time in that district, despite the fact that it's got the greatest Latino concentration in a state that has the greatest number of Latinos by population in the nation, this would be the first time you'd have a majority Latino district down there. And because we have at least perceived a democratic legislature, 
Democratic governor, there's perception that that might actually happen with that new district, and that would probably take that seat away from GOP control. So just giving you two examples of how politics, unfortunately, can get in the way of all these great population numbers that we're going to spend the rest of the evening talking about. So can I, before we move on to Tova and that question, um, ask you, there were, every time we get through with a redistricting, our 10-year battle, uh, people at places like the Kennedy School come up with all kinds of great plans to take the politics out of there, out of redistricting process, and to have um, a more straightforward, nonpartisan process. Do you see anywhere in the country that anybody is moving to take the politics out of this current redistricting? We'll see at the end of this cycle. There's been a lot of great movement uh, over, over the last couple of years uh, across many states to open up access points, whether it be fully independent commissions that have full control over the maps or places like New Mexico and others where you've got an independent commission who makes recommendations, but the legislature still makes the decision. And in fact, I, I'm doing a lot of polling right now across Southern states trying to figure out how to engage more of the everyday public, particularly racial and ethnic minorities in the process. And one of the big challenges is when we test this in messaging, a lot of Americans, particularly folks of color, their reaction is what's the point of getting involved? We all know it's highly partisan and it's controlled by the powers that be. So I think there's going to be unfortunately a bit of a lag as states move more aggressively to make things less partisan, right? Yeah. For the public to actually see that and see what they want from the process to be reflected. And, and hopefully that means increased involvement. Interesting. Tova. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm gonna sort of add to what um, Professor Sanchez was talking about that the context and the environment around the numbers and the changing numbers is really important. I, I have to start out with saying, well, part of this depends on how many people they manage to disenfranchise through restrictive voting laws and partisan and other kinds of gerrymandering. And in particular, one thing that doesn't get talked about very much, but I believe has a huge impact on the shape of the electorate is the issue of felon disenfranchisement, which as many of you will know, has until recently at least, um, disenfranchised 5 million people in the country, which is a lot of people. <laughs> and those laws have started to change. Um, and in places like Florida and Amendment 4, they have changed, but of course, new obstacles are being thrown in the way. So there are, are tremendous efforts to reach out to returning citizens and engage them in elections and in civic engagement more broadly. And I think that that could be something that is not much talked about, but could come into play over the next few years if, we, if people can become more engaged and be, uh, be welcomed into civic, civic society and elections. Um, speaking about youth, which is something that I have talked about, I have great faith in Gen Z. <laughs> Um, we saw a tremendous turnout in 2018 and then historic turnout um, in, in 2020. And uh, one of the things that I've been looking at is the relationship between all of the youth activism. So you see climate justice activism, gun violence, March for Our Lives activism, the protests around George Floyd. Um, all of this is happening at the same time as you are seeing a similar growth in, in um, in voter turnout among young people. And I believe that this is a very engaged generation. It is not a given that they will remain so. And I think that we can talk about a lot of the ways in which we can build upon the power that they displayed in the last few years or allow it to dissipate. But I do think that, that young people who, by the way, are an incredibly diverse group, I think something like 50% of Gen Z is, is um, of color, um, that we will, we will that, that this will, play a large role in, in both the short term and the long term. So can we follow up on that for a minute, Tovit? Nobody has studied um, more closely and smartly than you the relationship between activism and voting. And going back again to the Kennedys who are um, the uh, our sponsor tonight, in a sense, the um, there was a worry in the 60s that a lot of the youth activism, the youth would be turned off by the status quo controlling elections and say, geez, we want to be active, but voting isn't a way of getting anything done. You sound more optimistic that youth today are saying, we care about these things and we recognize that elections matter. Is that true? Or are you seeing disenfranchised as well as enfranchised young people? So I, I think you said it actually um, the same way that we've been talking about it. 
in the research that we've been doing, which is that um, Gen Z, these young people are much more sophisticated than you think. And while there certainly is huge um, you know, skepticism and <laughs> not good feelings about the two party system and um, where the Democrats are, let alone the Republicans, um, and, and thinking about voting in some ways as an establishment thing to do. I think that the young people that we've talked to and the research I've done is, is very pragmatic. They understand that it's, it's the full suite of um, things that you need to do in order to affect change. When we talk to them about how to affect social justice change, they may not put voting as number one on the way that they see um, social change happening most effectively, but they understand that it's gotta be in the mix from our, our research. And so they, they tend to talk about it as you gotta at least play in that game while we still have that game until we can change the game. Um, and so that's, that's what we've been finding so far, whether people get, young people get turned off by what happens in the next year or so, or, or you know, any other kind of short-term thing like that is hard for me to predict, but I was, I was encouraged. So when we, a number of people have used the word disenfranchise, and when we think of disenfranchising and trying to limit, um, suppress voting, um, today, most of the stories seem to be about Texas, but before there was Texas, there was Georgia. And I'm wondering, Kendra, um, A, what is going on now with efforts to disenfranchise voters, but also whether the results, and to me, the shocking results of Texas, not only of uh, Georgia, not only in the last election, electing two Democrats, but electing a black Democrat and a Jewish Democrat, you don't get more sort of surprising um, results than those. Is that a pushback of voters against the notion that they were being suppressed? Is it something else going on there? What is Georgia telling us here? I think that was a culmination of issues. I don't want us to read too much into what happened federally because what Georgia is very much, very much so still a red state um, in our state and you know local governments and in our electorate um, states as much when we are or when we are not going to doors, knocking doors, when we're doing focus groups, one of the things that we pushed back on and that you know our folks in the field have found is that they posture against this notion that Georgia is blue because people say, oh, aren't you excited about what you did? And they're like, what did we do? Because we have a very hostile um, climate um, coming from our state government towards our electorate where voting is concerned. It, um, we have one of the most restrictive um, voting laws that went into effect um, from this last legislative session, SB 202, where it criminalizes literally handing out water to people standing in line to vote, where it criminalizes trying to provide snacks for people standing in line to vote. Um, and so what it forces us to do then is to get very creative in our organizing um, in trying to challenge the state. And we'll see what their appetite is um, to arrest perhaps um, nuns and other clergy members who are willing to take arrest um, by going to hand out water while people are standing in line to vote. Um, we don't think that we're going to, you know, maybe do a trial run um, for the municipal elections um, this November, but obviously there shouldn't be a lot of lines because it's municipal, but we are fully prepared for 2022 um, to really see if the governor is willing to, you know, put the full um, breath of his public safety around, you know, arresting folks who are simply trying to provide nourishment um, while people are standing in line. Again, another component of that election law was to all, also restrict early voting. They've cut back early voting days. They have, we had um, access during COVID to um, absentee balloting without restriction. All of that has been rolled back. Um, and so we are in an environment when you talk about disenfranchising folks, um, people respond to that and they are, you know, they feel um, jaded about the electoral process because while the rest of the country um, is still on this collective high and celebrating about these two senators, what the refrain that we're constantly hearing is, but what does that mean for me? What, mm -hmm. what, how has that had any positive impact on my daily life? And then, it, you know, it does not help that the administration's um, policies have not trickled down, if you will. And it's not necessarily the administration's fault. Again, when you have a hostile state government environment, our folks 
um, for the most part, we still have people who have not been able to take advantage of the expanded unemployment benefits that the Biden administration um, codified because our state unemployment office um, has been very slow to the draw. They closed down all of their offices. People can't get access. They're not answering the phones. And so these are the kind of real world, th real world issues that, you know, when someone says, well, I gave you the vote, you told me, you know, to go to the polls and then my life would change. And then now I'm either worse off than I was or the same. So while you're warmed up, I just want to hit you with one more quick question, which is before we went live, you talked about some, to me, again, shocking numbers in terms of as we get ready for next year's Senate race and Senator Warnock is up again already, um, what the numbers are looking like there. Can you talk about some of those numbers? So we have some preliminary poll numbers and, and everything that we do with New Georgia Project, New Georgia Project Action Fund, though it is, you know, um, civic advocacy, it is all rooted in data. And so um, we had folks out in the field and we um, did some polls of the black electorate in the state of Georgia. And what we've gotten back is um, very disheartening um, because it is showing a softening of the electorate, if you will. And what I mean by that is that, so before um, Biden was sitting at roughly about 80% approval among black people in Georgia, that number has now declined to 60%. And, and then what we're also seeing that is that is having a, it is essentially a weight on the rest of the ticket. We presume um, and hope that Stacey Abrams um, is in fact going to run for governor in 2022. And her numbers once were at 90% and have fallen off 10 points to 80%. And this is just among Black people. Black people make up roughly about 33 to 34% of the electorate in Georgia. And we need our folks to overperform, if you will, um, if we have any hopes of having a shot of um, winning any of these statewide races. I just want to impress upon folks, though we do have two Democratic senators, a Black senator and a Jewish Democratic senator, we do not have one statewide constitutional office in Democratic hands in Georgia. Wow. Robert, you talked about the, um, uh, the increasing polarization um, on issues like race. And your research, I think, suggests it has to do with everything from Donald Trump to Black Lives Matter. I'm wondering whether you see um, hopeful signs in your research about ways that people might come together and we might really see some progress and, and some solutions on things. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I think, um, and, and you're referencing a report that we have coming out tomorrow, um, but you know, the, the optimistic sign that I see um, one of the things I talked about was the fact that we're seeing polarization between the parties, but polarization always isn't a bad thing, right? If you have two political parties where um, the people in those parties both kind of have views that are not very positive or not very good, that's not a polarized environment, but it's one where, you know, the electorate is kind of unified behind some attitudes that aren't great. So it, it was not even that long ago, the case that the difference between, let's say, Democrats and Republicans on basic questions about systemic racism against African Americans, th they looked different, but they didn't actually look that different from one another. Um, so what we've seen over the last, again, decade has, I think, been a rather positive story, which is that the Democratic Party has become much more liberal on some of these basic questions that political scientists have been asking for decades um, that spe specifically deal uh, with attitudes about systemic racism towards African Americans. There's a change in these high level attitudes. So that's a positive story, I think, even though it's causing polarization, even though it's becoming a more defining characteristic of the American electorate. I think a negative aspect of that story, just to sort of give a caveat, is that we're not seeing those attitudes sort of trickle downward into changes in people's views about policy. Right. So we are intermittently kind of seeing transitions in that sort of high level understanding of the forces that are operating in American politics and the actual nuts and bolts support for policies that might uh, ultimately change those situations. Right. So what percentage of Americans agree or disagree with reparations? What percent of Americans actually want police reform? What percent of Americans uh, support affirmative action. Again, on some of these, we have seen shifts over time, but it doesn't translate at nearly the level of some of these higher level attitudes. So again, I, I just think, you know, the, the story that we try to tell there um, is one that's, that's overall, I think in some ways optimistic, right? We are seeing trends that are quite positive, um, but this is not sort of a, uh, a completely optimistic story in the sense that these things haven't 
translated fully. And, and I think that's reflected by our politics and the fact that we haven't seen uh, movement on some of these big policy issues, even though there is supposedly been these high level shifts in attitudes. So Gabe, the, um, there's no issue that I can think of, no group where pundits and political reporting colleagues of mine got things more wrong than with Latino voters. Um, and there's also nobody who understands that segment of the electorate better than you. I'm wondering, was it simplistic when everybody wrote that in a state like Texas, Latino voters would turn it blue? And is there a lesson in terms of, um, of understanding a more nuanced take on the Latino electorate? Is there a lesson for Democrats and Republicans and the future of national politics? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, I think I, I could probably spend an hour and a half talking about this one. So I'll, I'll try to give you uh, the, the small version on this. Uh, but my take, and I think I've written about this in a couple of places, Brookings, for example, I put out uh, a blog post laying out my, my thesis of what explained the Latino vote in 2020. And there's been a lot of speculation uh, about whether or not Latinos have moved significantly to the Republican Party, whether or not that's going to continue. My take on it is if you look deeply, uh, like I have in, in the data over the last several election cycles, what really explained an increase in Latino Democratic vote share from 08, uh, 12, 16, was really an increase in underlying Latino racial and ethnic identity, uh, what us political scientists refer to as linked fate or group consciousness. And in fact, the data suggests that that became a more powerful explanation of Latino voting power than partisanship. It actually became more central to how Latinos are viewing the political world. And that was all driven by Latinos' experiences with discrimination and perceiving that they were living in a hostile environment that was anti-immigrant and anti-Latino, right? So you had that context driving Latino voting trends where you saw high numbers of Latinos, almost you know, arguments of monolithic uh, voting trends among Latinos. And then 2020 happened. And everybody says, oh, wait, we had it all wrong. My take is, remember, during 2020, not because candidate Trump wanted to strategically, but because COVID overwhelmed the overall space to talk about anything else, there was no anti-immigrant discussion. There wasn't Mexicans or, or these horrible things. You just didn't have that context. And as a result, that underlying sense of, of, of racial identity that was fueled by discrimination views, that went away. And guess what? You had more Latinos voting Republican, more similar to what we saw uh, some time ago when it wasn't that long ago, there was arguments that 40% of Latinos might vote Republican. So I think that more than anything explains what we saw in 2020, right? And the data bears this out. In fact, I've got an academic article coming out pretty quickly with a whole bunch of regressions, tons of data that basically shows in 2020, unlike what I described in the previous election cycles, partisanship and not an underlying sense of racial or ethnic identity was a stronger predictor of Latino voting trends. So that's my take on, on what happened in 2020. Obviously the multi-million dollar question is moving forward, 2022, 2024, what might happen? Um, I think a lot of it will depend on how Latinos view themselves in, in this larger landscape. And some data recently that I've been collecting suggests that Latinos actually perceive, that, again, that they're a population who's been discriminated against. And in fact, if we ask what's the number one to number five issues overall that the federal government should address for the first time in 2020 and it's continued, discrimination against Latinos is among that top five, which, which I think if, if, you're, if you're trying to, to peg down the math might suggest we might see a, a swing slightly back towards a greater uh, Democratic vote share among Latinos. That's the so, short version. That was a wonderfully uh, nuanced yet short version. And I have to just follow it up with, um, so I'm old enough that I can remember when Texas was all blue. Is it within my lifetime likely to be there again? Oh, absolutely. And, and that will depend on <laughs> the nuance to what happened in 2020 in Texas was more than anything, lack of investment in Latino outreach. Uh, there was, almost no money spent south of San Antonio in the state of Texas by Democrats or Republicans. And, you know, that's, if you look at some of those precincts, that's like 95% Latino precincts and most of South Texas. So a lot of when will, will Texas go blue will be a question of when the powers that be invest the right amount of resources 
to get those Latinos, particularly south of, of San Antonio, to turn out. We know that costs money, right? So I think it definitely will happen in your lifetime, God willing, um, <laughs> for you more than anything else in terms of, of your longevity. Uh, but a lot of it is going to be how much is going to be invested in, in engaging that segment of the electorate. Great. So, Tova, while um, baby boomers would like the conversation always to be only about baby boomers, <laughs> we're looking at a much more um, long-term and in lots of ways more interesting segment of the population. Um, I want to start out by asking you the assumption, and I know a lot of your research focuses on climate activists and other sort of um, issues group activists that we think of as being left-leaning. Is there the same energizing and the same increasing in voting spirit and numbers um, on the right as on the left, or is this mainly a, a democratic or a left phenomenon? Well, for a second, I want to underscore something that Professor Sanchez said, which is the investment of resources. And I, I, I think all of this is a caveat. I, I think Kendra can tell us better than anyone about the importance of organizing and grassroots mm -hmm. organizing and investing in grassroots organizing. And for as important as it is in Texas or Georgia, wherever young people are, they need that also is a very needed investment and something that needs to be paid attention to. Um, I think actually when can, we can I interrupt about, then for one sure. second, is it a different kind of organizing that's required when it's young people in terms of how you're getting to them and ways of bringing them out? Well, that's an interesting question and something that my ongoing research is trying to look at as to whether you know, there are more creative ways that we could be reaching out to young people, particularly young people of color, that is going beyond a piece of mail or a political speech um, that you know, may not be as appealing or resonant with young people. And so I think that that's something that we're continuing to look at. But it is important, I think, to look at the nuance in the, and the details of the turnout over the last couple of election cycles with young people. Um, it is true, I think, and Rob can probably correct me, but young people are definitely more progressive on a lot of the issues, and they are very issue-driven. I would not say that they are particularly fond of each, either party. Um, but at the same time, um, it's not like every young person voted for Biden at all. Um, uh, and in fact, um, the, the gap um, between white young people and young people of color and the gender gap is also pretty wide. And so Biden didn't win by that much among um, young white people, but he, he took a huge amount of the black, Latinx, and Asian American uh, youth vote. And so you have to sort of dig down into that to really get at it. But I think to the extent that they are driven by issues and not by parties particularly, and again, all this, you know, especially with young people is subject to change, um, that, that they are more progressive. And one thing that I was thinking about earlier with something Rob was saying is that um, with Democrats becoming more progressive on race issues than ever before, whether it translates into um, policy or not, when we were talking to all of these young people um, through the course of the research we were doing, they would, in the beginning, they were throwing around words like intersectional and really intersectional and all this kind of stuff. And I thought they picked up this word and, you know, they're, this is like cool for them. And they very quickly learned, not at all, actually, to the contrary, I was the one that was kind of, you know, if anything, was being glib about it because they, that's, they live that. That's not some theoretical thing to them. They live intersectional, this, you know, all, all the issues around race and sexual orientation and gender and all these kinds of things have a very different role in their lives, I think, than, than for us. Um, and so, um, so around all of that, I think you know, we need to pay also attention when we're looking at that, that piece of the electorate or the piece of um, you know, our, our society. So at the risk of being um, continuing to be parochial, um, sitting here in Massachusetts, <clears throat> we just had an election um, that pitted a um, 200 year old incumbent Democratic senator against a 10 year old challenger congressman named Kennedy. And shockingly, the 200 year old guy won and won, it seemed like, in every segment of the population, and in, including young people. Is there anything that that election um, says other than maybe that a Kennedy could actually lose in Massachusetts? W what does it tell us about young people? and their willingness to go for candidates who aren't necessarily um, young like them. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. Um, Sunrise in particular um, did a lot of work around that election. They did a lot of phone banking. They endorsed Markey because he had endorsed the Green New Deal. Um, and they can be credited, I think, legitimately with um, at least some proportion of the margin of victory. Um, and it just does also show their sophistication and pragmatism when it comes to politics. Um, they they understood who was, the, they, they weren't looking at it just as one factor, but who was really standing with them. And, and I, you know, it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see. I, I hope, and I'm beginning to see, I, I think, um, more young people as they do become perhaps more cynical about people in elected office running for office themselves. And so seeing more and more very young people running for office, and that would be even, even more encouraging to see. So Kendra, you were shaking your head when we were talking about young people, clearly a big factor in Georgia. Yeah, huge factor, but um, really I wanted to speak to Tova's comments. I know she's gonna be researching this, but yes, that you, I can answer unequivocally that you do have to um, organize differently around them. Um, the messaging is completely different um, with young folks. I, we um, take um, a lot of care um, to when we target that 18 really to 30 um, group. Um, we had, uh, and I'll just say this anecdotally, we had a um, video and some of you might have seen it. If not, you can Google it. It's not exactly um, family friendly, but it was called Booties to the Polls. And it was this thing that we put out there and we used strippers, you know, to kind of get people <laughs> excited about the election because I mean, strippers vote and people, you know, like young folks like strippers. And so <laughs> we, you know, did that, but there was a messaging um, behind it. And we got a lot of heat from um, the more, you know, kind of middle age, my age, you know, I'm 44, electorate, we call them the aunties. Um, they did not like it. They did not like um, that, that we were using that tactic, if you will, and putting money behind it. And we use a lot of young influencers as well. I mean, I think the key is, you know, um, and Gabriel can speak to this. I'm a former pro political scientist myself. Um, a lot of people find it boring, man. Like they don't want, they don't even want to take poli sci classes. It's, you know, it's dry. You got an old white dude up there talking. Like you really got to love this thing in order to, you know, really want to study it. And then civics education, you know, K-12 is lacking um, for lack of a better term. And so I think, you know, it's just kind of designed for people to check out and to dismiss it and say that's for other folks. And so what we try to do is make it exciting and say, you know, knowing we have to connect the dots. We have to show them, you know, if you get from, you know, you don't have to beg for policy outcomes when you vote in people who are already good on your policies. And so it's like, that's what we're doing. So to Tova's point also about getting young people to run, like we have a little that represent Georgia. Um, I was actually hired to, to seed um, a nonprofit that really, you know, just trains people to run for office. And it's just trying to build out that grassroots pipeline. I think um, um, in the progressive ecosystem, we did ourselves a disservice by really focusing and honing in all of our messaging, targeting the presidency. And you had all these other offices that just, you know, we seeded over to the other side. And it's like, no. And, you know, and then what we've also found too, and one of the things I always speak to, though I am a, you know, former fledgling academic is we are too, we adhere too rigidly to resumes and to folks with a bunch of letters behind their names. And the other side doesn't do that. Like we need charismatic folks, right? Like if we want our county commissioners, if we want our school boards, if we want to shift and we want to really show people the power of government and by having progressive folks sit in these, in these offices, we have to stop acting like everyone has to be four-year college degreed on our side before they can run for something. Give me the kid who, you know, everybody loved in high school, who might have been a C or D student. He stayed back in his hometown, might have gone to community college or whatever. Let's tell him about the virtues of, you know, progressive policies. And then let's train that young man or that young woman to run for office and serve our community instead of dismissing them, you know, and trying to get someone who, you know, might again be a doctor or an attorney or, or some other pillar of the community. Um, so we really, again, focus where young people are concerned. We, my question to them when I am talking to them is why not you? Because I think there's this assumption by young folks that people that hold office know what they're talking about. And they don't. They don't. They're just the only ones that run. So like we're trying to make it accessible. But so I just want to push back on one thing that you said. So you, you vote for people who have a track record of supporting what you believe in 
On the other hand, it sounds like your poll numbers are saying, we're not going to wait forever for you to deliver on what you promised that you believe in what we believe in. And they're already saying, you know, even for Stacey Abrams, going from 90 to 80 percent among mm -hmm. the black community is a big deal. Um, is patience, are we less patient than we were historically in terms of people delivering on the promises they make? Or has this always been this way? No, I would just, so this is what, so 2020, I, I would say that we were put into a position and I'm trying to speak um, where we voted for someone, a lot of folks, black folks in particular, young people voted for someone who was not our first choice. And so then this person gets in and, and is truly the manifestation of everything that we thought the individual to be. And so now you're like, okay, you know, I did this thing. I held my nose. I did it for the, you know, the greater good. And now look at us. Right. And so what I was saying was you want to put the folks in who already share your values. Mm. I would argue that for a lot large swath of the black community, they don't think that the current administration shares their, share their values from the get go. They just held their nose and put them into office as to thumb their nose to Trump. And it's collateral damage that Stacey Abrams and other people's numbers exactly. are going down because of the great. Exactly. So there are um, people are being wonderful in our audience and submitting really smart questions already. And the, so I'm going to go to a few of those. And there are a series of questions that they have and that I have about um, in this era of the virus. There's nothing that's not touched by COVID. And maybe starting with you, Gabe, the question is, is the isolation aspect of the pandemic and the heavier reliance on social media and, and the internet already affecting, and as the virus continues to up and down surge, likely to affect voting behavior? Absolutely. Uh, we, we saw that through the pandemic, right? Where how we mobilize voters shifted, right? At least on, on one party side more than the other, moving away from large events, moving away from door knocking and, and using digital campaigns much more effectively and being creative and how to do that, how to reach folks. And so a lot of it is like many things across our country. There was a lot of things we learned how to be innovative about during the pandemic. Are we gonna continue with those patterns moving forward? And probably the most institutional factor that will impact what voting trends look like in the next midterm election, and particularly the next presidential, is states lack a lot of protocols to make voting much more accessible for everybody, right? Most states uh, made same-day registration temporary, uh, drop boxes, uh, use of, of mail-based voting, all of those things to decrease the cost associated with voting were done, and guess what happened? Turnout increased, particularly among young people. Right? Whenever you decrease the cost associated with voting, political scientists will tell you, you're always going to see an increase in civic engagement. So unfortunately, when many of us thought, okay, this worked, we saw a greater turnout, we'll see states continue this process moving forward. Obviously, we've seen at the federal level and across states, this is highly partisan. Right, Some states are moving aggressively to make voting easier. Others are running in 180 degrees in the other direction. Right, So how folks engage with the voting process, um, how they get their political information. Obviously, the pandemic and the isolation associated with that is going to influence how people moving forward think about the political realm. Biggest danger I see, and this was not created by the pandemic, we were seeing trends in the data before this, is the high level of misinformation and consequently lack of trust in mainstream media across the electorate. Right, And that's been significant across just about all swaths of the American population. So moving forward, as we hopefully start to see some trends moving away from the pandemic, will trust in political institutions, mainstream media, each other, will those things return to where they were a few years ago, or are we gonna to continue to see a downward trend? And the reason why that's an important question in the context of voting, trust across all those different avenues, guess what? Predicts voter turnout and predicts voting behavior. So I think that's one big scary monster uh, that I don't see moving in a positive direction anytime soon. So Robert, can I follow up on this COVID question with you? Um, naively, as a longtime health reporter, 
I would have thought that COVID would have been an issue that brought the electorate together, that everybody is worried about dying or their parents or their kids getting sick from COVID. And instead, it seems to be almost as characteristic as the issue of race in terms of the kind of um, disunity that you are seeing in your studies. Have you looked at COVID and where do you think this would play out in the kinds of things that you look at? Yeah, and I, you know, I think it's important to contextualize um, this in, in the sense that, you know, I think sometimes if you think about replaying history like a hundred times or something like that, how often would certain kinds of dimensions of our politics recreate themselves? Now, I, I tend to be in the camp where I do tend to think that things that are core to our, our identity, um, issues that are close to what it means to be American, immigration, attitudes toward immigrants, attitudes towards Muslim Americans, uh, attitudes about systemic racism in the United States, that if you were to replay, you know, let's say the last 20 years of American history 100 times, you would actually see those pop out again and again. COVID-19 actually, I think, falls much more into the category of kind of an oddball one, right? I, I think there's every reason in some ways to believe that absent a President Trump, you actually might have seen a lot more unity around the issue of COVID-19 than we saw. I, this is just tends to be one of those things where um, the forces that are in operation in our society are kind of like hurricane partisanship, right? And even things that aren't really charged with it can get caught up in those currents if, if we choose to inject sort of politics into them. But I think this is one of those cases, just this is my own personal belief, is just that COVID-19 could be far less polarized if it weren't essentially for the president that we had at the time. That I think a, a President Romney or a President Jeb Bush or somebody, somebody like that probably would have taken a, a much more reasonable set of stances. Uh, you probably would have seen partisanship sort of at play there to kind of bring people together a little bit more um, rather than what we did see play out and what we are seeing play out now, which is um, that you know your vote share right in 2020 is highly predictive of how many cases you were having for a period there. Um, you know, just even like a month ago. Um, so, so again, I, I think this is one of those things that has become polarized, but this wasn't set in stone. It didn't have to kind of be this way, unlike other aspects of our politics where it probably is a little more locked in. Yeah, so at the risk of being partisan, um, I would say that my dog catcher in Katuit, Massachusetts would have taken a more reasonable stand and been less polarizing than the president was on this. Um, so I want to, um, Tova, I want to read you the next question that was submitted and the um, and this may not be your thing, but you're a smart analyst, and maybe it maybe you'll have an answer anyway. Um, the question is: Have there been smaller county or state elections in the past year that provide insights into how the 2022 midterms might play out? And then the questioner asks: Naturally, with the understanding that a lot can happen between now and the midterms, anything we're always looking for sentinel events that sort of tell us where we're going. Anything that you've seen out there? Well, so there are two states that have statewide elections in about 10 days or so, mm -hmm. and, and many, many more that have municipal elections happening um, in early November. So I think that there are gonna be a few, um, at least people will presume that they're indicators <laughs> um, of something in the future, even whether they are or not. I know that people are looking certainly to the gubernatorial election in Virginia as maybe something that will tell us something about um, young people in particular, perhaps, but other groups as well, as to whether they re repeat the kind of turnout that they had in a presidential election year. I will note, and you know, this is not a statistic, but it came through very often when we talked to young people that they were trying actually to have local elections be an entryway to in federal and presidential elections, which was fascinating to me because we know that turnout rates in these elections are terrible, um, and we're always thinking of it the other way around. But um, especially for young people who did not have leadership at the state and federal level that they uh, were aligned with, whether they could get involved in local politics and see the dots being connected, as we said before, um, in a better, in an easier way at the local level. So um, I think it'll be really interesting, if not in this cycle going forward, if actually that plays itself out and young people, as they have, you know, this has been happening with DA's races across the country, right? Um, in some places where people have been able to connect those dots between your everyday life and living and existence to those local positions that you elect. And so I don't, you know, I, I just, you know, I have no way of knowing, but I mean, it would be a very interesting thing to track as to whether that continues to go in that direction. Uh, can I just stop you for one second? That is a very unusual statement for um, 
a political scientist to say, I have no way of knowing. I'm not None a political that scientist. Anyway. That's what makes I'm it sorry, great. That is why. Okay. <laughs> um, so, Kendra, when we talk about sentinel elections, was it Gwinnett County that you were talking about at the beginning? Yes. Is there a lesson in that is a dramatic transformation in a short period of time um, in a county? Um, is there something that happened there that can be a lesson uh, either as a sentinel or as a an aspirational lesson for the country in terms of what happened there? I would say the lesson or the takeaway from Gwinnett County was intentionality. Mm -hmm. um, there was a collective focus on changing the representation of the elected representation of that community. And what I would say is when we talk about when Gabriel has mentioned it, Tova has talked about it, um, resources. I mean, that yes, that's money, but time is also a resource. Um, strategy is also a resource. And it's so it's like when you focus attention on something, what we learned from the Gwinnett County is all things are possible. Um, you will have to understand, like there were a lot of naysayers. And again, it was, you know, going into the AAPI community and, you know, intentionally canvassing and go TV efforts and getting those folks out to the polls, right? And so focusing on these, you know, granular communities that I think for a long time, they felt like they really had, no, there was no space for them um in you know the in, in the civic community and so when you had a, there's a, let me just say this let me back up there's a huge and robust progressive ecosystem in georgia with lots of different groups of which new georgia project is singularly one group and so when you have galeo or Puerto latino or all these other groups working to bring out and to educate their electorates and meeting again, meeting folks where they are, you know, um, you know, carving out our canvassing turf, hitting specific doors, doing three and four passes on a household, and not just during election cycles. I want to, you know, really tell folks that that is not what we do. New Georgia Project is 365, 24 seven, um, organization. There is no off cycle in Georgia. There's an election that is occurring every year. And so when we talk about deep relational organizing, to me, that is the takeaway for a place like Gwinnett County. We've done it so long and it seemed like, yes, it was a very um, short amount of time in which the change took place. And that is in fact true, but that organizing had been going on for years prior in communities, because what you have to do is you have to build trust. People get so sick of the transactional nature of election cycles. You show up at my stinking church or my synagogue or my mosque two months out from an election, say, hey, give me your vote. And then I never hear from you again until it's time for you to run again. And so what you have in the grassroots movement is you have people that are carrying the water of a progressive message in the community building trust. But what is happening is when we don't get policy outcomes delivered, it is undermining our work and making it more difficult. Couple that with redistricting and other things that, uh, you know, dampen um, actual representation by, you know, dumping all progressive in, into, a, you know, a small swath of a community and uh, these weird little maps that are drawn, you know, the electorate looks and say, this fight is fixed and I'm not going to participate. So one more quick thing on Georgia. Have it Given the implications of the two Senate races and given the publicity that they got, especially because they happened later than the rest of the elections, um, have people from around the country been coming there to study what Georgia did? Um, I, yes, I would say there are people that are coming to study or who have come to study. There's been lots of articles, lots of requests um, from folks in our organization to contribute um, to interviews. Um, I, I would say the spotlight is still on Georgia. I think people, you know, thought we caught lightning in a, you know, in a bottle and, you know, it was a one time occurrence. I don't think um, that is in fact the case. Um, we had a lot of people come out of um, huge monetary investments um, flowing into the state. And I think what people, they're trying to replicate what we did. Um, we're getting a lot 
um, of folks in other, particularly Southern states, but also outside of the South, um, other groups that are germinating and popping up um, and then calling on us to say, hey, you know, what is it that you guys did? You know, I think we could, you know, have similar results in Missouri, or I think we could have similar results in North Carolina. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to think very, in, you know, strategically and intentionally about, you know, how to, if you will, um, create a curriculum of sorts of the New Georgia Project way and get that fanned out to other areas like Alabama, like Mississippi. Um, there's no reason that Mississippi um, should be represented in the way that it is currently given um, the number of black people in that state. And so it's like, but again, we, you know, have a tendency to, you know, kind of cast the South off and focus on a more Northern and um, what seemingly more progressive um, states. But, you know, we're in here for the long haul and, and we hope that folks will continue to focus on the work that we're doing. So Gabriel, the um, I hate to keep making you the expert on Texas as well as <laughs> lots of other things, but the um, this is seems like a question best directed to you. And the question is, how long can Republicans stave the new voters going to the polls with their overt efforts to ballot access? Or maybe ask another way, is there any limit to how far voter suppression can go? Yeah, great question. I, I'd open this up to other panelists if, if folks have insights on Texas and want to jump in as well. Uh, but I think that that pendulum, if you will, right, a lot of it is at what point, right, will you see enough new population growth, right, new voters with resources put behind them to mobilize those folks to be able to shift some of the down ballot races, right, so that you don't have Republican control over all decisions related to elections, right? And I think that that pendulum is really what we're talking about, right? At, at some point, we know from the messaging that we've worked in Texas, as well as everywhere else across the country, not just among Latinos, but particularly communities of color, when you frame messaging that just acknowledges directly that there's direct opposition trying to minimize their political influence and voice, and the only way to combat that is to turn out to vote, despite all of that overt racism, right? Those messages work. And we put them in play uh, throughout the 2020 election cycle. Uh, I'm assuming they're going to test well in 2022 and beyond. So we'll put those in play again. And we still, so we know that mobilizes voters. But how do you use that strong power of mobilization, right, coupled with resources and all the great ground game to get people out to vote when they realize, right, the deck might be stacked against them? And I think that really is a fundamental question because voters are rational and they say, look, I, I really uh, risked my life in the context of COVID to stand in line and, and exercise my right to vote. And we still didn't get the outcomes that we were hoping for because the system was rigged. That is a really, really strong oppositional obstacle that's put in play by design. And all the rest of us are trying to overcome that, right? So at what point will that happen? That's very difficult. Um, I will say that I think the end of the day, it will be dependent on two factors, resources coming in at a level to overcome that big scary monster of voter suppression in a state like Texas, and also candidates, right, deciding in some cases to do what's best for the collective and not themselves. And I'll say, I hate to pick on anybody, but Beto, most of us say, if he would have said, look, maybe it's not my time to be on the presidential ticket, there's an open US Senate seat, if I were to happen to have run for that open U.S. Senate seat, my opinion is we would have saw a different overall statewide outcome in the state of Texas. Hmm. It's really interesting. The, so, Robert, I want to um, take uh, direct this one to you. And I don't know that it's something you've looked at, but it seems like you're looking at partisanship um, on so many levels. And the question is, partisanship has been one of the strongest predictors of vaccination uptake in our surveys, even within racial and ethnic groups. Um, and this is something that, that Gabe posed as an issue that talking about partisanship, I'm wondering whether you've seen as a partisan predictor, um, anything on the COVID front. Yeah, and I think that was actually a comment from uh, I was from, from Gabe. Gabe. Yeah, that might be from Gabe here, but um, we have also been running uh, surveys that have, um, tried to track this, especially vaccine hesitancy. And, and again, you know, I think the geographic data in some ways doesn't lie, just that 
vaccine uptake, the number of cases we're seeing. Um, there's a point here. Now, this is sort of an interesting twofer comment, but if you take the county level um, election results from the year 2000 and you compare them to COVID, you know, like, like I think the 2020 election results, it's a less sort of powerful predictor of the vaccine sort of rates than is like the most recent election. So like even with vaccination rates, the number of cases that we're having, this is for a time period there, this is really becoming quite a quite a partisan issue. Again, there's a rate at which people are just sort of having uptake on these things that that sort of overcoming these things at some level, but there's still a, a rather stark partisan divide. So I want to raise a different kind of issue and whether um, get anybody who wants to jump in on this take on whether this could be an effective um, organizing issue for the midterms or beyond. And it has to do with the Supreme Court. And one of the um, long lasting impacts Donald Trump has left on the country was getting three Supreme Court justices. We're already seeing in this term decisions that are being made or decisions that seem about to be made on issues ranging from um, voting suppression laws to abortion that have been mobilizing issues um, in the past. And I'm wondering whether you see the Supreme Court becoming an, an issue that young people, that minorities, that others will be drawn to the polls because of. Um, starting with you, Tova, any, any sense that young people that you're looking at care about what the Supreme Court is doing on all these things? And so I, 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 I joked with my friend Rob that if I didn't know the answer to anything that came up tonight, I was going to say that he did. Um, but that actually might be true at this moment because I'm not a pollster, so I don't know what's driving young people on the issues. I can say that um, matters, issues of race and racism and structural racism, Black Lives Matter, George Floyd were extremely motivating factors for young people last year. Um, but I would, I would defer to Rob on, on whether he has any polling on that actual question. No recent polling, but just to say that I think it would be a shift. Right, that I, I think that um, by and large, you haven't seen people on the left as motivated by the Supreme Court. Like, the, you know, that's just sort of a step removed, um, I think, from, from how Democrats talk about politics sometimes. Um, that I, I have not seen as much motivation around that particular issue. Um, and it seems like, you know, as Tova's mentioning, there's some of these other issues that have, uh, are far more near and dear to the heart. Kendra, if they strike down Roe versus Wade, is that a is that a potential big organizing issue in Georgia? Yes. Um, what the reproductive justice is one of our campaigns, um, and we put a lot of time and energy behind it. And it's actually um, one of the issues that resonates the most um, with the younger electorate. And so, yeah, if, if Roe v. Wade was to go down, I think that is a, a, a definitely a message that we would run with. Um, particularly among um, young women and young women of color. Um, it, it's something that they feel very strongly about. What I will say um, is that, you know, in a lot of um, progressive circles, you will find that issues of um, reproductive justice um, will take a back seat to issues of race um, among um, Black people. Um, but that doesn't mean that the issue isn't important. It's just that, you know, it is not the kind of um, guiding issue out there. But yes, if something was like, like that was to occur, we would certainly be out in community. And I can certainly envision um, black and brown um, folks in Georgia protesting. So Gabe, I don't know that you have done any research into the next question here, but you have something interesting to say about everything. So I'm going to try it on you. And it is going forward, do you see big data and AI having a significant impact on electoral campaigns and outcomes, and will it put a premium on a candidate's ability to raise money? Yeah, so I got two or three part questions. So I'll give this one a shot, but again, <laughs> open up to panelists. So on one hand, absolutely, because big data and AI is impacting just about all aspects of, of US life and global life. So absolutely, and we've seen that play out already, right? Campaigns, particularly the Trump campaign, utilized right, big data and not so much polling to a great extent and argued that it was incredibly effective. Um, whether or not that's true or not, that's debatable. But I think because somebody was able to utilize it, at least argue that they utilized data algorithms to a much greater extent than traditional polling and were successful at least for one campaign, other folks are gonna try to mimic that and figure out how to tap into that. 
Um, other piece of the puzzle is um, all of us pollsters, even though we might not think about it this way, rely on big data all the time to draw our samples. And as polling methodology has shifted, very few people will answer a landline phone if they even have one. And we're moving away, at least my team, completely moving away from random digit dial approaches and thinking about more underlying consumer data and other big data to try to figure out right, who to contact in our polls to begin with. I already see that train moving right, in terms of, of thinking about at least big data, maybe to a lesser extent, AI driving right, how we think about politics, um, how folks are, are outreach to, and all the different mechanisms right, in, in the big overall campaign right, infrastructure uh, that, that comes into play every two to four years. So yes, I, I think there's going to be movement in that direction. Do I think it's a good thing? Uh, maybe not so much. And moving away from voting, but just thinking about, let's say, criminal justice reform, an area I've worked a, a lot on with people much smarter than me in the context of AI, one of the things that always troubles me is when we start talking about big data, AI, there's this perception that it removes racial bias from the equation. And unfortunately, that's 100% inaccurate. A lot of the assumptions that we build into what we tell AI and big data to do are still racialized at the end of the day. Um, so I think there's a big uh, maybe overestimate and how a movement in that direction will remove, uh, remove racial bias and minimize racial bias. I'm of the opinion, not so much. Uh, it's still garbage in, garbage out. If you put assumptions into the system that are unfortunately riddled with racial bias or other uh, biases, those things are gonna be reflected in the outcomes. Anybody else wanna weigh in on AI or big data? Not. Oversold. Oversold, yeah. uh, both. AI, big data, oh, both. I, I think I think especially within politics, it, you know, it. it um, what you tend to find is this is uh, good marketing um, more than anything else. Um, I, I think I'll agree with Gabriel just to say that um, typically um, the level of sophistication of an algorithm that you're running is far less important than the ingredients that you put in there, um, right? This is like making a good stew, like three turns of the spoon when the moon is in the right place. And you can have all those instructions, but have the right ingredients that are going into what you're doing is typically much more important. Um, and a lot of that other stuff. It's not to say there aren't marginal benefits, there can't be improvements, but it's a lot of marketing most of the time. I'll give you one good example that backs up Robert's point. But one of the big data algorithms that was used a lot in 2016 and 2020 was looking a lot at, let's say, church attendance, getting all these different data points, putting them into an algorithm. Well, that predicts Republican voting behavior for the overall U.S. population. But guess what? For Latinos, the exact opposite. So a lot of it is, right, who's running that big data? What do they actually know about the nuances of the population to make sure they're running the right algorithms? So we tend to look at um, the census data that is coming out now and mainly focus on its impact in terms of redistricting and who's going to get new seats in Congress or wherever. Anybody find things, and Gabriel, I'm particularly, I know that you do a lot of plumbing of census data. Anything else that you're seeing in the census data that tell us interesting things about where the electorate is moving? Um, I'm glad you hit me with this because in my background research for this, I have one like little interesting factoid that was not like immediate, but more long-term and deep thinking implications. So I'll hit you with that one because this question provides it. Uh, there's a lot of talk about just the overall Latino population numbers, right? They accounted for half the overall growth, 62.1 million, all of those big eye-catching things. Deeper in the numbers that only a few of us that, that study these numbers or living are really intrigued about is the fact that the percentage of Latinos, and this is unique to Latinos as a population because they got two questions, right? Um, are you Latino in terms of your ethnicity? And then the follow-up is what race do you identify as? One of the biggest eye-catching things for me in the census numbers is the drastic drop in the number of Latinos or Hispanics who identified as white racially. Dropped from almost 27 million in 2010 to 12.6 million in 2020. Big number. The reason why that's important, myself, Pew, a number of other folks staring at the last census numbers made a lot to do with the fact that if a large numbers of Latinos identified as white racially, what does that mean about the browning of America, really? And what tipping point would we see in terms of whites no longer being the dominant population, et cetera? A lot of conversation about that. 
These new census numbers suggest a whole different pattern, and particularly among young people who are not identifying themselves as white racially uh, the way that they were in 2010 and, and, and prior years to that. I think that's a really interesting question. We're only starting to uncover why. Um, one of the more interesting theories, and, and that's one that I probably would support, is maybe it's the fact that leading up to the, the 2020 census, you had large forces, right, trying to undercut Latinos' participation in the census, lots of anti-Latino discrimination at play across the country, maybe a large segment of Latinos who maybe in years past thought of themselves as white racially, realized that might not be a decision they actually have the power to make. And if society doesn't treat them as Latino, a, a concept many of us in social sciences write about called a scribed race, I might think about myself as white, but if society doesn't accept me that way, maybe they're moving away from that identification into other race, which saw a huge jump among Latinos. So a big one to unpack, but I'm glad you asked me that question because I got a chance to reference that, that I found in my background research that I thought was really interesting. Can I just take this as an opportunity for a second because uh, it's um, it's really unfortunate that Professor Tech Lee couldn't be with us because it is really important to acknowledge um, the role that Asian Americans are playing in the changing electorate and the changing uh, face of the country and that they are the largest, the, the fastest growing um, minority group in, in the country, I believe. And there were, there they also had um, a vote increase last year, especially in particular places. I know um, Kendra and Georgia, the APIA community was extremely active and made a huge difference. Um, and that also for the first time that um, like the Latinx community is at long last not being treated as quite so monolithic Asian American as well. And so that's just, I just want to put that on the table since Taiku was not uh, able to be here, but I just, it's an important point to also um, put into the mix. So Robert, you were about to jump in on something. If it's okay, um, sure. Uh, just a just a plus one on uh, what Professor Sanchez was pointing out. I think there's a there's a little nuance here, and again, I think it's it's things that we're still figuring out ourselves. There was a change in methodology in terms of how census actually classified people between these two censuses, and the changes probably would have produced higher levels of people uh, identifying as multiracial or being classified as such over time. So I don't think this takes actually away anything uh, what P Professor Sanchez was uh, talking about in the fact that there may be a very much higher percentage of the Latino population in the United States that's not identifying as white than we had previously thought. But I, but I think the, the nuance on that, if it is in fact the case that this is due to a methodological shift, is that we actually have to do a little bit of rewinding history. We have to figure out how, you know, changing our perceptions going back to even to 2010 to say, well, this wasn't even always the case back then. We were just kind of mismeasuring it and we were kind of messing it up because by all accounts, actually, I think the methodology that was used in the latest census probably superior to the one that we were using back in 2010. So we opened up the discussion tonight by my asking you um, all the same question, which was the single most important near-term change um, that you saw happening in the electorate. I'd like to close, we've got about 10 minutes left and I'd like to close by asking all of you um, one last question. And that is, what is the single thing that gives you the greatest sense of optimism in terms of the work that you're doing as we move ahead um, to consider electoral changes here? Um, starting in reverse order of what we did last time, Tova, what makes you optimistic about things? I think I already gave my answer away. <laughs> I said it. I think my answer in the very beginning was that I had great faith in Gen Z, and I I, I do have great faith in Gen Z. Um, I think that their activism was amazing last year. I do think it is possible that it will only grow, but there have to be a number of things that align for that to happen, um, including what I referenced earlier, which is the resources. But we do also see um, that there is some connection between youth activism around issues like climate, which is much more urgent concern in some ways for this generation than, than everybody else around racial justice, around gun violence um, that are really motivating and mobilizing. And um, I, I think we also will need to, to, to look at how this breaks down um, racially and ethnically as there are differences in turnout and in voter preference by race and ethnicity and gender. Um, but I, I think that this is a very engaged group um, that understands 
um, race and ethnicity and gender and sexual orientation and all of these different issues in a much different um, way than, than their predecessors. So that is reason for optimism. And I thought you were going to tell me that you were going to predict that the Yankees were going to beat the Red Sox next year. <laughs> the, uh... I didn't want to lose the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Gabe, what, is, what gives you hope? Yeah, I'll, I'll follow my, my colleague Tova on two points. One is, as she referenced, the AEI PI community needing to have some reference. I'll also just drop some data real briefly on Native Americans, a population um, I didn't find a path to, to jump into, but they also saw a huge increase, 86.5% increase, 5.2 million in 2010, almost 10 million in 2020. So the Native American population also highly relevant in, in the last election cycles, uh, really swinging Arizona. I would say a combination of Native American vote increase and Latinos was a big story for Arizona. So thinking about that population moving forward with their increased in turnout uh, gives me a lot of optimism. Uh, but similar to Toba, it's really, for me, uh, the strong optimism I have in, in youth overall, not even naming one generation, but just the youth, I would say more than anything, what, what gives me optimism, not so much their voting trends and their voter turnout, but the fact that they're much more loud in their voice than my generation was in politics at that age. And what I mean by that is they're willing to take individual level risks, right, that I don't think my generation was willing to do to advance collective causes that they care about whether that's marching in the streets, whether that's risking their livelihood in terms of their job potential as a consequence of being loud in their activism, they've demonstrated that they're willing to make those individual level sacrifices for the collective good. That gives me a lot of optimism. They're going to need it because all of our data suggests through COVID, if we look at economic stress, the under 30 population was the most likely to see job loss, uh, financial strain as a consequence of COVID. So, a lot of optimism, but they're going to need it because they're facing very difficult economic challenges right now. Are you an optimist, Robert? And what what makes you that? Um, I'm probably not an optimist, so your so your question is catching me off guard, but that's okay. Um, I'll I'll give two things very quickly. I think one is actually um, seeing how um, many people engage in the 2020 election not just sort of voter turnout, although I think that is a story that happened, but you saw uh, different parts of philanthropy, you saw different parts of corporate America, you saw lots of forces that suddenly had not had skin in the game previously. And it's not to say that they all performed excellently and that we can't expect more of them, but I think there was an improvement relative to previous times in history when they were taking things seriously and, and, and thinking about their own actions. Uh, and it gives me some sense of optimism that that is at least possible and that we can in a crisis moment uh, sort of see different communities activated and pushing in the same direction. Just to plus one, I think uh, uh, my other two panelists here, um, just to talk about young Americans, just a fun fact, uh, 2024 is probably the election when Gen Z and millennials will actually outnumber the number of boomers in the electorate. We are at, at the very least, a symbolic turning point uh, in this generational story of America. Um, and I think it's sort of important to note that the type of impacts that I think we're likely to see as a result of that. So I take it that um, if I would ask you overall that the numbers that your study will release tomorrow make you more pessimistic than optimistic. I think I think the report for tomorrow it's a it's a mixed story. I think as it often is when we talk about race in America, two steps forward, one step back, two steps back, one step forward. That that's how the the uh, progress around that issue has often existed, and I think that's something that's a story we try to tell. Um, I think there in that report as well. So Kendra, the um, you come from a state, or you're living in a state now um, that gave a lot of people a lot of optimism uh, a year ago. Um, is there more? What's, what's your uh, hopeful take? So I'm an eternal optimist, unlike Rob. Okay. Um, that's the, sm the constant smile on my face. And I won't belabor the point because I think there's consensus among the group. Um, my optimism lies with the youth. Um, and I think nationally, um, the youth vote made up about 17% um, of the electorate in Georgia and made up 20% of our electorate. Um, people are invigorated. People are excited. They're, they want their voice to be heard. They want something to believe in. I think we are failing them, but not giving them that. But we fight regardless. Like we, 2020 was the first win um, that progressive, um, the progressive ecosystem had had in Georgia in a while. 
Um, but, you know, we continue to get out there every day because we know that, you know, change is incremental. And so what we, you know, I'm excited about what I see on the ground. I'm excited about how our effort is growing. I'm excited, uh, excited about um, the diversity um, of our effort and all these different folks, you know, coming together. Um, I'm excited, excited that America is finally waking up to the fact that rural is not synonymous with white. Um, there's all of these different things that we've always known in the South that I think a lot of folks are finally, you know, um, speaking truth to power um, more publicly and in their writings and kind of understanding the nuances of what goes on um, down in this region that I love so very much and have, you know, chosen to live and to work and to toil. And so, um, you know, I don't know what 2022 is going to hold with regard to electoral outcomes, but I know um, we're going to give it our all. And are you optimistic that Stacey Abrams could be the next governor of Georgia? Extremely optimistic. I mean, <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. So I think that is the note to end on. But the note that I want to end on is to thank four extraordinary panelists for giving up um, a critical hour and a half of their lives for this, to thank the wonderful Liz Murphy and Alan Price from the Kennedy Library for pulling this together, and to thank everybody who tuned in tonight. Um, and I'm not going to say anything. We've had perpetual updates on our screen about the game, but I'm not going to say anything about that. And I just want to say thank you and good night to everybody.